Good evening, listeners. It's Owl Stretching Time. And now, here's your host, Frank Macaluso. Thank you, Isaac. Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to our very first episode. You know, for a long time, I was very interested in psychology. I, I even took an AP psychology class in high school. It was one of my favorite classes. I, I always paid attention and worked really hard. I think it was because I had a crush on this one girl who sat behind me. Or maybe I was trying to impress my long-dead father who I felt I could never please. Either way, I felt so much in love with the subject that I briefly considered becoming a psychiatrist. Then I got hit in the head with a large fish over the summer and I forgot everything I ever learned in the class. But I never forgot Oksana. Or was it Petkana? Or maybe it was Cynthia. Uh, what was I talking about again? You were introducing the first sketch. Oh yeah, thanks. Well anyway, here is a look into the wild, wild world of psychiatry. Good morning, Doctor. Come in, Brad. Sit down. You know, Doc, I think I finally made a breakthrough. But you just got here. I know, but but I've been spending a lot of time thinking since our last session. Oh boy. And I think I figured out the root of all my psychoses. Brad, you only started coming to these sessions last week. I think we need a little more time before we can determine- Doc, I think- I really think I've got this all figured out. And I would be careful before tossing the word psychosis around if I were you. Please, Doc, just hear me out. All right, Brad. What do you think is the root of all your issues? Okay, dig this. I'm ashamed of my family. That's it? Yeah. I mean, think about it. Why else would I close myself off like I do? Obviously, it's because I grew up surrounded by horrible people. So I started thinking maybe everybody was that horrible. Take my sister, for instance. Hell, I can take her for a long walk on a short path for all I care. She once stole a sheep from a petting zoo. Just jumped right on his back and rode it right out the front gate. Last I heard of her, she was still on the lam. And then, there's my Uncle Tommy. Now, he was a hitman for the Mafia, but, but he had all these creative methods for killing people. He was heartless and cruel, but I'll give him this. He was creative. He once beat a guy to death in the middle of a rice field with just two small porcelain figures. He always told me it was one of his favorite assignments. He called it the knick-knack paddywhack. And then, there's my Aunt Gertrude. Now, she once went into a zoo and snuck into all the aviaries, each and every one of them, and got all the birds there high on LSD. She left no turn unstoned. Now you see why I'm so messed up, Doc? This was all just an excuse to practice your stand-up routine, wasn't it? What? You set up these sessions just so you'd have someone to practice your jokes on, didn't you, Brad? No, Doc. How could you possibly? Yes, I did. Get out. But wait, did, did I do good? Did, did, did you like the material? Out! C come on, Doc! I need the feedback! My, my parents won't talk to me anymore! My wife has left me! You're lying! Would you believe my dog left me? Get out! Get out! Get out! Hey, sorry! He was using you. I, I know. They're all using you. You've got to stop. Shut up! You must kill them all. I said shut up! They're all using you. They're all against you. They all must die. For the love of God, would you just shut up and leave me alone? Uh, I'm here for my appointment. Is this a bad time? No, come on in. And now, a message from Jonathan Higgins the president of the American Association of Cannibals. Uh, greetings, my fellow Americans. Uh, in light of recent events, uh, we, the members of the American Association of Cannibals, feel it necessary to declare that while we do find the actions and beliefs of white supremacists and white supremacist groups deplorable, we, the American Association of Cannibals, do not condone the punching of Nazis we do, however, condone the caramelizing of Nazis until their insides are stretchy and sweet, and serving them with a side of potatoes au gratin. 
or dicing them up and sautéing them with some leeks and some onions, or serving them up on a bed of jasmine rice, or mixing them into egg foo young, or grinding them up and stuffing them into pot stickers. Mmm, pot stickers. Ah, 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 ah. Uh, yeah. After all, there, there's nothing inherently hateful about a good lunch. The views and opinions expressed by Mr. Higgins do not necessarily reflect those of this station or its staff. And now for a brief message from one of our sponsors. Hello. As your Red Barn agent, I'm going to do something I've never done on radio before. What's that? Help you combine your home and auto insurance. Red Barn can do that? That means I can do anything on the radio. Like build a time machine, go back in time, and beat up Shirley Hackett. What? That'll show her for kissing Barbie Parker under the tall oak tree in the park when we were little. Lady, calm down. Sorry, I can't hear you. I think you'd really better think this through a little more. I mean, you don't really know what that thing could do, and it's just really not like the best choice. Yes, it's finished. Now to do the deed. Lady, no! Oh my god. Well, I got into the machine. When they saw me, they ran like chickens. I think Shirley may have even had a coronary. Are... are you okay, lady? Oh, I'm just peachy keen. I'm a monster! I'm like Jeff Goldblum in The Fly! Don't... Uh, don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll try and figure something out. Hi, Ray. How's the commercial go? Oh, sweet, merciful crap! What the hell is that? I'm getting the bug spray. Henry, don't! She's a client! I don't care! Eek! Eek! Actually, it's just a generic brand I got at the dollar store. Anyway, die, fly demon, die! Ah! I'm melting! Melting! What a world! What a world! We hope you save money because we can, but we try not to mess with a space-time continuum because stuff gets weird when you do that. Red Barn Insurance. Call an agent today. What the hell was that? Uh, anyway, uh, you know that old saying, uh, all good things must come to an end? Well, apparently the inverse is sometimes just as true. Bad things seem to never end. For example, soap operas. Here is the latest installment from what is currently the longest-running radio soap opera today. When the sun goes down, one can see the true darkness in Decatur. When last we left Decatur, earnest little Mindy Juarez, an aspiring actress and WSOY's most popular DJ, was having a heated argument with her roommate, Crystal Cleghorn, the daughter of a wealthy socialite. got to let me be on your show. It's been so long since I've been the center of attention. I feel so unloved. I mean, uh, besides, you could use a little star power on your show. For the last time, Crystal, you can't be on my radio show. This is my one chance to show that I've got talent of my own. That maybe some talent skull will discover me. And I can leave this hick town once and for all. I'm not going to let you steal this opportunity from me. Fine. If I can't be on your show, then I'll be the end of your show. Just you wait and see, Mindy Juarez. Just you wait. Oh, the nerve of that woman. I'll get it. Wait. I'm the only one here. Oh, never mind. My goodness. It's Barbara Hurleyhe, Decatur's most paranoid psychic. Quick, Mindy! You've got to hide me! My evil twin sister, Eva, is coming to town and she's going to kill me! Oh dear, that's horrible! How did you find out? I had a premonition about it. It came to me in a dream. There she was, standing in my doorway wearing a hockey mask and wielding a chainsaw! Wait, if she's wearing a hockey mask, how did you know it was her? I recognized her voice. She barged into my bedroom, shouting, I'm coming to get you, Barbara. Well, I guess you can hide in my closet until she gives up and leaves town. Oh, thank you. 
I sent her coming! Quick, hide! I'll get it! Oh, damn! Hello. I'm looking for my twin sister, Barbara. Does she live in this building? You must be her twin sister, Eva. You know her, then? Nope, sorry. Drat. I came all the way over from Schenectady just to see my sister and return this chainsaw and hockey mask I borrowed from her seven years ago. Oh, well. Perhaps next year. Well, goodbye. Well, what do you know? Barbara's twin sister, Eva, didn't want to kill her after all. I better go tell her. I'll get it. Wait. We don't have a doorbell. Eh. There she is, boys. Grab her. <laughs> hey, let me go. Crystal, what are you doing? Making good on my promise, Rumi. Now, let's head down to the radio station. Will Crystal bring an end to Mindy's radio show? And to Mindy? Will Mindy's bloody demise at the hands of Crystal's henchmen be broadcast live for our entertainment? And what about Barbara? Will she ever come out of the closet? All these and many other questions may or may not be answered on the next episode of Darkness in Decatur. And now it's time for Farnsworth's Fables, narrated by Reginald Q. Farnsworth. Thank you, Frank. This week's fable is The Pied Piper of Hamelin, adapted by yours truly. The story takes place in a small German town called Hamelin. Now Hamelin, for a while, was a poor little town full of poor little people. There was one resident of Hamelin, however, who was neither poor nor little, Johann Diedrich von Schickelgruber. In fact, he was the richest man in Hamelin, and he made sure people knew it. One year, a particularly dreadful year in fact, Johann Diedrich von Schickelgruber announced that he would be running for mayor. The way I see it, friends, there's nobody else more qualified than I to be your next mayor. For one thing, I'm devastatingly wealthy. Now, I didn't get to be so wealthy by making bad decisions. Oh, no. Over the years, I've developed an extraordinary business acumen. And I've used that acumen to amass myself a ton of wealth. When elected, I will use that acumen to restore our lovely city of Hamlin to its former glory. City? I thought we were an autonomous collective. Shut up. Uh, thank you. As mayor, I also promise to deal with the great menace that has plagued the people of our poor little village for far too long. Wait, a village? I thought this was a city. Maybe we're a municipality. Shut up. Uh, thank you. Uh, anyways, I said, when elected, I will fight the great menace that has caused our town's ruin. Children. Every day after school is let out, children run amok throughout the town and they disturb our places of work with their shouting and running and gallivanting about. This is why our town has become as destitute as it is, friends, not to mention how they keep their parents up late nights with their play and their difficultness. This results in sleep deprivation, which makes those parents poor workers. Again, resulting in our town's destitution. When elected mayor, I will see to it that the menace of rowdy children is dealt with soundly, and Hamlin will once again be prosperous. Yay! Yay. And so it came to pass that Johann Diedrich von Schickelgruber won the mayoral election by a landslide. That is to say, a landslide had prevented most of his detractors from making it to the polls. But that mattered very little to Johann Diedrich von Schickelgruber, who now sat in his large, warm house, contemplating with his assistant, Franz, how to deliver on the promises he had made. Come on, you bobblehead, think. How am I supposed to make Hamlin prosper? Well, uh, you're the one with the business acumen. Why can't you think of anything? Because running a town is very different from running a business. Besides, I made most of my money by inheriting it from rich uncles who bid it. And I'm all out of uncles. 
And if that information leaves this room, I swear I Don't worry, sir. My lips are sealed. Well, uh, maybe we can't solve the whole make Hamlin prosperous again thing tonight, but we could tackle something else in the meantime, like uh, how you said you'd deal with the children. Ugh, children. Good God, how I hate children. Even when I was a child, I hated me. Lazy good-for-nothings, that's all they are. Mommy, buy me this. Daddy, help me carry that. Feed me, bathe me, read me a bedtime story. And what do they give back for all they get? Bubkiss. Damn freeloaders. Why don't they get jobs like good upstanding citizens? Well, they do have to go to school, and then there's... Shut up, Franz. I've just had an idea. We don't good children of this town will get jobs. I'll make it mandatory by law. And any child willfully without a job will be shamed in the town square. Quick, Franz. Get a pen and some paper. I've got a law that needs dictating. Well, uh, I've already got my notebook and pencil here. I could just write down what you're saying now and transcribe it later. Fine, fine. Anyway, I, Johann Dietrich von Schickelgruber, in my capacity as the mayor of the hamlet of Hamlin. Wait, the hamlet? I thought we were a municipality. Shut up. To hereby decree that from this day forth all children in Hamlin will be required to work full time. Those who choose not to shall face a penalty of 48 hours of public shaming in the town square. Uh, hey boss, I just thought of something. What if there aren't enough jobs for other children of Hamlin? Simple. We have all the adults retire. There will be an interim period for job training, after which every job in town will be held by a child. Town? I thought we were a hamlet. Oh, shut up. Say, you have a son, right, Franz? Uh, yeah. Well, I hope he's smarter than you are, because effective tomorrow, he's gonna be my new assistant. Ah, coitus. And so it was that over the next two years, every child in Hamlin who was able to work had a job, and each business thrived more than ever before. Why, the only place in Hamlin to close its doors permanently was the school. There was no use for it now, for there was no one who would, or even could, go to a school. Eventually, the schoolhouse was converted into a coffee shop, but that doesn't really matter in the terms of the story. Anyway, one day in the middle of Hamlin's newfound prosperity, the small town soon found itself flooded with rats. No matter where you looked, rats were afoot! Would you... Rats! If there's anything I hate more than children, it's rats! At about the same time, a group of traveling musicians arrived in Hamlin, hoping to get a few gigs. Uh, say, man, are uh, you the mayor of this town? Yes. Can't you tell by the sash? Well, I guess they don't give mayor sashes to just anybody. Darn right they don't. Now, what is it you want? Uh, we were looking to play a few gigs in your town. What type of music do you play, then? Uh, waltz, marches, baroque sonatas? Ah, man, we play jazz. Jazz? I don't like jazz. Beat it, you filthy bums. Mayor Schicklegruber! There's rats all over my house! There's rats in my house, too! They've eaten all my food, and they've locked me out of my own bathroom! I need to go potty! We can't live with these pests! What should we do? Say, I think me and my band could help you out with your rat problem. And how, pray tell, are a bunch of... Uh, jazz musicians going to rid our town of rats? Easy. We'll play our music, with me leading on flute. And then we'll lure all the rats down to a boat by the docks. Once they're all in that boat, we'll cut that boat loose and send those rats rolling. 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 Rolling on the river. Rolling on the river. What was that? Proud Mary. I don't like it. And I don't like jazz. Well, which do you hate more, man, jazz or rats? At the moment, rats. One just bit my ankle. So you'll let us do our thing? Yes, yes, just get these vile rodents out of my town. All right. There is just one more thing, though. What? Our fee. Uh, lousy money grabbing. All right, what's your price? 250 bucks. 250 dollars? Hey man, we're in the Union. We don't work for anything less than scale. 
Fine, fine, just get rid of these rats. So the band began to play. And the rats became enchanted with their tune. They followed the musicians to the river and were lured into a nearby boat, which the musicians quickly cut loose, sending the rats as far away from Hamlin as a tiny little boat on a tiny little river can take a large mischief of rats. Na 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 na, na 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 na, hey hey hey, goodbye. When the job was done, the musicians went back to the mayor for their pay. But Mayor Schickelgruber proved to be far less appreciative of their services than they had expected. You expect me to pay you for polluting our towns there with... Uh, jazz? Beat it, you hippies! Hey now, you're forgetting that we helped you get rid of those rats. I'd rather have the rats. Now be gone from my sight and be gone from my town, you riffraff. Fine, old man. But you're gonna pay. Just you wait and see. That evening, in the outskirts of town, with their equipment set up, the musicians began to play another song. Uh, which one do you think I should bust out for this one, the flute or the tenor sax? A bigger brain requires a bigger instrument. Tenor sax it is, then. <laughs> And the sound of their music soon reached the town of Hamlin, where the children were all beginning to close shop. Wow, Dick, that crazy tune! Blow, man, blow! When they heard that hypnotic tune, they all began to head for the outskirts of town. When they had got there, the musicians led them to the next town over, a town where children were allowed to be children. Or at least they would have, if anybody there were able to have children. Nonetheless, both children and adults were pleased with this new arrangement. Hello? Hi! I'm a kid all the way from Hamlin. I followed a bunch of musicians here, and now, if you wouldn't mind terribly, I'd like to live with you. At least until I can get back on my feet and can afford a place of my own. Greta, come quick. Our prayers have been answered. At last, a child of our very own. You can throw away the cardboard cutout, Liebchen. The adults of Hamlin, however, were far from pleased. In fact, they were outraged. Hey, how come the coffee shop isn't open? I want coffee right now and I can't have it right now? I'm outraged! You think you're outraged? My mail hasn't been delivered yet! I'm not expecting anything because I never get mail, but I'm still peeved. You think you have it bad? I haven't eaten yet because no one at home made me breakfast, and none of the restaurants are open. What in the world is going on around here? Why is nothing open? Where are all the children? They should be up and working by now. Unless... Oh no. The little bastards, they've run away. I should have known this had happened. You can't trust children to be responsible with anything. What are we going to do, Mayor? Who do we get to replace them? I'll figure something out. I'll show those no good children that we don't need them. But Mayor Schickelgruber never did figure something out. And soon the people of Hamlin left town, heading for a new land filled with new opportunities. A land known as the Roanoke Colony. Huh. No wonder that place didn't last long. <laughs> and so ends my story. Thank you for letting me into your homes, and I hope you don't mind that I took some of your silverware. Ta-ta! That was Reginald Q. Farnsworth with Farnsworth's Fables, which is our last bit for tonight. Now, before we close out tonight's program, I, I feel compelled to take a little time to talk about Hurricane Harvey, the, the, the recent, all the recent uh, disasters that have happened. Uh, Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Maria now, which is, which is starting, which is adding on to the devastation of Hurricane Irma, especially in the Caribbean, uh, then the, the, the earthquake in Mexico City. Now, if you'd like to help all those, all the people who've been affected by these disasters, I, I would encourage you to seek out local charities, you know, cut, cut out the middleman and donate local, uh, like to the, uh, Houston Food Bank, or the Hurricane Harvey Relief Fund, or there's even a Hurricane Irma Relief Fund. Just seek out 
the local charities and do do your research, seek them out, make and don't make make sure they're like make sure you're giving to reputable local charities and don't give just once. Like donate whatever you can, whenever you can, throughout the year and onward. Because when tragedy strikes like this, there's usually this this big in, initial outpour of donations, like the first month or so, and then there's nothing that come like nothing coming in because people just assume they can just give once and and everything is fine. But but these these like Harvey and Irma have done incredible damage. Like like it it's not gonna take it's not like just that initial outpour is, is not gonna fix everything. So I would encourage you to remember the remember the areas affected by those disasters throughout the year and throughout the next year and continue to donate whenever you can, whatever you can. Uh, normally we won't we won't end episodes like this, but uh, it's just, it's just something that's been on my mind and on my heart for for a while. So anyway, we'd like to thank you all for tuning into Owl Stretching Time this week, and we hope to be with you once again same time next week. Until then, good night and take care of yourselves. That was Owl Stretching Time, starring Frank Macaluso, Brian Barker, Emily Bowes, J.C. Overa, and Michael Santos, with Lane Casper and Isaac Weezer. This episode was written, directed, and produced by Frank Macaluso. The script advisor was Emily Bowes. This is your announcer, Isaac Weezer, speaking. <laughs>